I'm looking at uh, who's on here, and, and I think uh, most of you have played with uh, the business model canvas a, a bit, so, um, so you're probably going to end up teaching me, but, um, but this is all good. Um, so I've got my screen shared, I think. All right. Now comes the moment when uh, I have no idea which which screen you're seeing. Perfect. The big screen or the little screen is good. Okay. The, the big one, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> um, great. So, um, yeah. So this is the first uh, session in the, in a series of, uh, of of webinars and, and discussions that uh, will sort of. Um, Try to pull together some of the support that we've been doing. So just a quick overview of, of those sessions. Um, this week, we're just gonna we're gonna go over the business model canvas. As I mentioned, most of you have um, been working on yours, and so none of this is going to be new. But we'll we'll take time at the end for for you all. Let me we'll take time at the end for you all to share yours if you'd like some feedback on it. So um, so why don't you uh, think about preparing um, a uh, a slide or a way to share it and then we can maybe you know see who who wants to uh, get some feedback on theirs and present theirs um, next week we're going to go over uh, financial modeling and um, we've got um, thankfully uh, Iago and Amelia have um, volunteered to uh, to use their the business they're developing as a, as an example for um, for that financial modeling exercise. That's going to be two sessions. Um, Kumar, I'm, I don't remember the days, but I think what, maybe Monday and Thursday or something like that. Um, one of them, I think, was changed. The, the timing was changed. Anyway, and Ben Guillon, who's on. Hello, Ben. Good morning. Um, he's going to be leading that, mostly. And hi, then... Ben. Hi, Ben. You sound a little choppy there. Um, it's early morning for you, too, I think. So, um, and then after that, we're going to, um, what's the next section? I think it's uh, looking at uh, uh, investor presentation. Again, Ben's going to be leading that one. And then we're going to talk about um, a, a, a two-part a two session on identifying and prioritizing finance solutions. And so that there are, you know, Different different sections are relevant for different projects, so they may not may not all be relevant to you, but they should all be very interesting. And then finally, we're going to end with um, webinar talking to some um, you know investors about uh, about financing, so both grants grants and investors. So that's going to be the, the sort of session it runs. Uh, I think to sometime mid August, or at least the first week of August. So. Um, Anyway, this is the first one, and great to have you here. Let, let's um, maybe just go quickly around the room so everyone knows who's on the call. Um, it would be great if you ha could turn your cameras on just for the introductions, um, at least. And, you, and it'd be great to have you, if you feel comfortable having your cameras on the whole time, that would be, that works as well. So um, let me figure out how to get, Participants here. Okay, so um, I've got you know my participants list um, seems to be completely random, so I'm just going to call people's names. So Kumar, why don't you start, and then Jonathan and Alois, just say a quick hi, who you are, and. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks, David. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Kumar. Um, I'm sure I've interacted with, with a fair number of you already, um, but I am part of the Secretariat and um, responsible for communications and just kind of helping uh, David along. So, very excited for this, uh, this learning module. And, um, and yeah, thank you so much. Jonathan? Hi, we have some uh, construction going on in the background, so it'd be better for me to stay on mute and just listen to the conversation, but happy to be here. 
Hey, thanks. Okay. Uh, Alois. Alois, are you there? Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Alois. I am with Rejuvenate Unchava. Two of my co founders are here, Debra and uh, Lynette. Good to be here. Ben, Guillaume's next, Chris Gordon after that, and Amelia. Yeah, I don't know if you guys can see me. Yeah. Ben Guillaume, I'm uh, one of the co chair of the uh, uh, of the incubator, and uh, uh, in my day job, I own a consulting company that's focused on uh, on conservation finance, and uh, uh, we're also an investment manager in the, the conservation space. And I'm looking forward to working with you uh, for those couple of weeks. Excellent, thanks, Ben. Who is after that? Chris, uh, Chris Gordon, you there, Chris? Mm, not hearing you. Something's up with your microphone, I think. Um, I was been um, Jonathan, Lynette, and then Sean, and then Tabby. Hi, everyone. My name is Lynette Chabang. I'm with Rejuvenate Chava, uh, part of Alois team. Thank you. Sean, are you able to unmute, unmute yourself and uh, say hi? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sean Nazaralia. I'm in Mozambique and interested in, I'm, I'm, I'm a mentor for one of these incubator projects and uh, just interested in seeing the training session. So I'm actually here twice. So the other Sean is also me just because I only have headphones on one instrument, so. So I shouldn't Thanks. call on the other Sean now as well. Don't bother. Okay, and uh, let's see, I mean, things are moving around a bit, but I think it was uh, Tabby maybe next. Hi, I'm Tabitha and I am here on behalf of Green Stand. Um, we're in the incubator and super happy to be here. Great, thanks. Um, I think we maybe missed uh, Victoria, and then we have Yago and Debra, and I'm sure I missed one person, Amelia maybe. Um, so let's start with uh, Victoria. You, I guess you got construction uh, going on there. Uh, yeah, we have construction here, um, but happy to be here. Um, we're working on a financing project for conservation, uh, like everybody else. Uh, that is like PACE, Property Assessed Clean Energy. So, thanks. Great, thanks. Okay, and then Jago and Deborah. Hi there. Um, my name is Jago, and uh, I live in, in La Paz, Baja California. It's, it's pretty early here as well. Um, and yeah, we're working with the CFA uh, to develop a so social enterprise. Um, um, in order to find a, a circular economy solution to ghost, ghost fishing nets. Um, we got it with Emilia, who is somewhere here. And we're very happy to be here as well. And yeah, we have lots and lots to learn. So yeah, very happy. Thank you. Thanks. Let's see. I know I missed Emilia and then Deborah. I'll go. Uh, well, as Iago said, I, I'm working with him in that same project. Also living in La Paz, which is really hot right now. It's 7 a.m. and it's boiling. <laughs> uh, and we are very excited to uh, talk to you about our project and all the struggles we've been having. So happy to hear some feedback. Great. Okay. Deborah? Deborah, are you able to unmute yourself? Um, no, so I don't think Deborah's mic microphone's up and working. Hopefully, you can hear us, Deborah. Um, Deborah is, works with Lynette and Alois. So, um, great. So that's everyone. I think I don't think I missed everyone. Chris Gordon, are you able? Were you able to unmute yourself and 
Say a quick hi. I don't think we got you. Mostly testing the microphones. Yeah, I see you've unmuted yourself, but I still can't hear you. Okay, well, glad you're- Did you you're... see the chat from Chris Gordon? Oh, no, I'm sorry, didn't. Chris sent a little message in the chat just saying he has very, very poor internet, but thankful that he can see and hear us all. Perfect, okay. Great. So let's move on then to the uh, to this, this presentation. Then we'll have plenty of time to to discuss afterwards. Um, so this business model canvas is basically, um, as you all know, it's a it's a one page business plan. And um, let me see if I can get my little screen back here. There we go. Um, and uh, um, what we'll do today just is you know kind of review those elements of the business model. Um, uh, I, I have your exercise developing a, a business model canvas, but we'll just go through um, some examples of them. And then I thought um, we could, as I mentioned before, some of you could perhaps share yours that you've been working on um, and, uh, and then and explain a bit and, and uh, get some feedback on it. So it's, it's really a, a quite a useful um, document. Um, the, the, there's a, a bunch of resources online around this. You know, a lot of people have used them. Um, David, these are two you're not actually sharing the PowerPoint on the main screen. Oh, I'm not? I, I can see it in the main screen. I don't know for the rest. Um, so sometimes you're this, sometimes you're okay, No, that was me, sorry. Okay, all right, great. All right, so, so good. So you can see the slides. We're good? Okay. Um, so uh, the um, right. So so there's a couple of different websites you can go. Strategizer's got a, a lot of, of um, information on this. Uh, um, Alexander Cohen has um, a lot of free material here. Um, much more. We're going to you know they go into much more detail than 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 I'm going to hear. And I just wanted to thank also Mike Malloy of Halcyon House. He provided some uh, some powerpoints and guidance. And on all these powerpoints should be up. Um, all the, the background guidance should be up online at the incubator resource page. Um, and maybe Kumar, you can send around a, that link again just so people have it. Um, so what is it? Uh, it's an inter Iterative framework for startups to document, challenge, and communicate a profitable and sustainable business model. Um, the idea is you sort of put all your main thoughts on this one page, and uh, it's small enough and it's short enough that you can keep changing it. You know, when things, uh, when you're learning about what the, your business is, when you talk to different people about the business and you say, oh, well, we don't understand that, you can really easily adapt this. A, a longer business plan. Um, it's harder to, to make changes at, right? So um, so this is, again, everyone has seen this before. This is uh, the, um, the, you know, structure of it. Um, really quickly, you have um, sort of, in my, the way I look at it is you have this sort of val value proposition in the middle here. Um, and then here's your sort of, I would say inputs so, you know, your sort of su suppliers and um, key partners, what you're doing with all that, key resources, th turn them through the value proposition and, and, then, and then you sell them to people. And this is these your customer relationships, your, your sales channels, if you will, um, your customer segment, segmentation. And so on the left side, here's your cost to produce the goods and here's your profit or your revenue streams uh, from selling the goods or services. So that's sort of how I see this structurally. The, um, here's the sort of definitions um, of all those different boxes. Uh, so customer segments, who are your customers? What do they think, see, feel, do? Obviously not my writing, but um, uh, quite good. You know, um, A lot of guidance suggests that when you're ready, you actually go and try to talk to your customers and your potential clients, like over a hundred, um, to, to see what they think and see. Um, value proposition, and, and there's an S here, so it could be more than one. What's compelling about the proposition? 
why do customers buy, use your products or services? So what is, what, pro, what, what pain are you trying to solve or what, what advance are you trying to provide? What, what are you doing for your clients? Channels, okay, how are these propositions promoted, sold, and delivered? Why do you use these channels? And is it working? Um, so this, when it says promoted, it's, 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 uh, talks about communication as well, but really it's also primarily about physical delivery and, and um, that kind of thing. Customer relationships. How do you interact with the customer through their journey? And what, what it, their journey means is their, their, their customer journey. So how they're, um, how they're sort of interacting with your, with your product. Um, it's often not a simple direct relationship. It's often, um, you know, the reason why they turn is a journey. It's, you know, they, they maybe discover the product here. They've heard about it through friends. They found it online or something like that. And then, and then they, they move through a, a journey of understanding and then desire and deciding to actually buy your product. So that, so it's not a simple, it's not simple. Um, revenue streams, that's, that's pretty obvious. How does the business earn revenue from the value proposition? Again, with an S, could be more than one. Uh, key activities, what uniquely strategic things does, does the business do to deliver its proposition? I thought that wording was interesting. Um, it's not what you're doing, but what are you doing that's strategic, right? What are you doing that, that's, that's special that you, that's that's deliberate, that um, is seeking to deliver your value proposition. Um, key resources: what what unique strategic assets must the business have to to compete? For example, you wouldn't say, "Well, we need paper." No, you need you know it's it's everyone can get paper. That's not a strategic resource. And key partnerships: what can the company? Um, <laughs> What can the company not do so it can focus on its key activities? In other words, what, what partnerships can complement you so that you can really focus on, on your key activities? And I think that um, we'll, we'll be able to explore that in different ways uh, going forward here. And then cost structure. What are the business's major cost drivers? How are they linked to revenue? Okay. The... Uh, you don't have to go from top to bottom on this list, for example, and you don't have to go from left to right on the, on the uh, business canvas. You can start um, from the value proposition, start from what you know, um, build things from there. Um, so this is a you know, suggestion of how to use a business model canvas. Um, document what you believe to be true about your business in the canvas, and then validate or invalidate the hypothesis with hundreds of customer discovery interviews. This is a suggestion, this is for, for companies that are really, you know, that when, you, when you're gonna do this, you don't wanna build a company and, and quit your jobs and, you know, try to raise a, you know, a million or, or, or more based on just talking to a few people. You, you wanna go out there and talk to a lot of people. Um, and then communicate the business model to, to the team, advisors, stakeholders, Customers, everyone, you can so you can use this as a very useful tool. Okay, let, let me just stop there. With any any questions about the use of this so far, or any thoughts on this? If I don't hear anything or um, see hand raised, I'm not sure how I can see hand raised. I'm going to just go forward. Um, so here's again the structure of it. You've got your um, your value proposition sort of right in the middle here, um, key partners, key activities, key resources, costs on the left, revenue on the right. And on this side, it's about your customers. Here's your, what are your relationships like, your customer segments, and your channels, okay? I think again, most of this is, uh, is familiar to everyone. Um, and here's just, an, uh, another image that, that rephrases a lot of those different, um, uh, the different blocks here. Um, trying to look to see if anything is really interesting. 
you know, again, the value proposition looks at, at the problem that you're solving. It's pretty much it, pretty much what I described before. Okay, and so here's the first uh, example. Um, Kelly's lemonade stand, refreshing lemonade. Um, okay, this is just a, a, a made up example, um, just to go, just to show you how it works. Again, most of you have um, done this at least once, so you're, you're quite familiar with it. But um, here's the value proposition. That's where I always like to start. What is it? What is uh, Sally's, uh, Kelly's lemonade stand providing? Cold, tasty, natural lemonade on the go. Great service, okay. And um, so, well, who's buying it? I, 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 that's where, I, maybe I'll go first. Uh, customer segment, park visitors, people coming to the park. They walk right by Kelly's house, okay? And so Kelly's uh, got this cold, tasty lemonade. Um, the relationships with the customers here, it's described as personal, okay? Kelly's sitting there at her stand and she's selling that. Um, and what are, what are the uh, sales channels? Um, well, primarily it's, it's the booth. So she's not only is she selling, physically selling the, the lemonade at the booth, but also that's how she's communicating with her customers through that. But also she's put together a little website. Okay, great. So we understand people come to the park, they buy the, 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 the lemonade. She's got a booth there. And, um, and she has, tries to maintain personal relationships with all the, the customers. So, all right, what is she doing then? How is she getting there? So what are the key strategic activities she's, where she's making the lemonade? Um, she's marketing that lemonade with, with the advertisement, and then she's selling the lemonade. So she's making it available. She's marketing it by, with a great sign. And then and what, you know, what are the key resources she needs? Ingredients, salespeople, the booth and equipment, all the basics. And who are her key partners? Municipalities, I guess she needs to have the right to sell the, the lemonade there, right? So she's so licensing, whatever, okay. The, 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 um, the town says it's okay. Her cost structure, well, she's gotta pay for ingredients, the equipment, um, flyers to get people to come, um, and then, takes home her salary and commission. So those are, those are the costs. Not, not unimportant to remember that. And the revenue streams, of course, are the lemonade sales and the tips that she gets. Pretty straightforward business, completely described in this canvas, right? Um, it, not that we needed to explain how a lemonade stand works, but, um, but it's nice that it's all spelled out there. But let's try something a little more complicated here. Um, LinkedIn, the world's largest professional network. Okay. <clears throat> In this case, and I'm going to switch screens here, so I'm not going to be looking at you just for a second because uh, you don't care anyway. Um, so I can see better. Um, the value proposition. Let's take a moment to read that. So they have four different value propositions um, and they're color coded here. Um, and the reason that they're color coded here is so that you can tie the value propositions to your customer segments. Okay, you see this top one is, which is manage professional identity and build a professional network. That's for the internet users, the sort of clients that are not these other clients here. So they've segmented their customers to internet users, recruiters, advertisers and marketers, and developers, right? And you can see you can have different, um, you have different value propositions for those different customer segments and potentially different different relationships. So here for the internet users, they, they've got this amazing thing called the network effect, you know, like I'm on it, I invite you, you know, we, so, so that network effect is, is called same side network effect here. And um, that links up the internet users or the general LinkedIn members with 
um, this value proposition, which is where I as a member want to manage my professional relationship. Recruiters, on the other hand, um, are benefiting from this cross side network effect, right? And here they want to identify and reach the right talent for recruitment. So they're able to use the same system, the same company, um, but there's a different value proposition. There's a different relationship. And we've identified that through having a clear customer segmentation here. Um, interestingly, the channels here are not necessarily related to these different customer segments. Um, you've got your, your, your website and your mobile app, you know, mostly. And then I guess field sales, um, it, conferences and things like that. So you're trying to build awareness. Um, revenue streams, interesting. Can, can be also segmented by the different uh, uh, client uh, and customer segments so that you, um, for your main users, you realize that, well, the whole network effect, the relationship that we have with, with all, all of our clients is built on this network effect. So let's, let's give it away for free and then we can throw in premium subscriptions. They probably came up with the premium subscriptions later, you know, like the first idea is build that network. Okay. And then, and then, you know, maybe they realized, okay, we've got this recruitment opportunity here, different, different class of customer. Um, let's charge for hiring solutions, develop the whole range of hiring solutions, um, offer that as a separate um, thing. And then for advertisers, there's marketing solutions. So they've now integrated advertising. In. So you, you maybe start off with um, being unsure what you're, uh, revenue model is going to be knowing that there's value in the network, um, building it up with um, plans to later expand to generate revenue from all these. Um, uh, not real interesting here with those key activities, but let's look at the cost structure. You've got you know your web hosting costs, your marketing and sales costs, mostly personnel, um, product development, general and administrative costs. General and administrative costs are something that you know are your your op, your your top uh, company management your um uh, all the all all the costs that are associated with uh just sort of general operations and and um general administration legal finance all that stuff um has a nice spot in the thing called general and administrative costs anyway that's a much more complicated one any questions or thoughts on that No. Okay, um, so it's pretty straightforward. I mean, there, I've got a few more here, but um, I don't know whether we should go through them or whether people are ready to sort of share some of theirs and get some feedback on that. Um, anyone ready to share their, their business canvas and looking for some, for some feedback? I could I could call on you, but um, all right. Should we do one more while you think about it? I know that a few of you do have um, some really interesting ones. We got I got BMW or, or Uber. Should we go with Uber maybe? All right, let's do Uber. Um, all right, so let's see. Uber, what an interesting. Um, company. All right, so the value proposition here is um, connecting riders with drivers. That's the general one, right? So it looks like they've, they've kind of put it above the other four. Okay, and then some other sort of sub value propositions here. It's the easiest way around. You don't have to worry about your car, parking, whatever. You just use your app, call them it's anywhere, anytime. Um, it's low cost but it's luxury, you're actually getting driven there, right? Um, and there's various levels of service I could get, uh, you know, Uber LX or whatever, what's the, the, there's a fancy one with a big car or something like that. Um, and, um, and then for the, you know, again, here, look, you've got, you've got two colors here. You've got the, the riders and the drivers. The drivers are the people who want to earn money driving. The riders are, people who need a ride um, but there's a value proposition especially for the drivers which is earn money when you want you can add this to your 
current uh, salary. You can just make some money on the weekends. You can, so that's a, that is a value proposition and an important one for the drivers. Um, customer relationships, this is an interesting one. The rating system, you know, like I'm, I'm scoring you, you, you know, everyone wants to have good scores on that. Um, so that's what they've identified as the sort of something that really solidifies the, their customer relationship. I'm a 4.9. I don't know what I am. Um, and then the channels, primarily through the app, right? So, you know, all your interactions are through the app on the phone. However, they do have other communication channels. They have advertising, they have other things like that. But, um, and again, you know, your revenue could be divided up here, but, um, but they're, they're uh, saying for both customer segments here, you've got um, your charges and then your surge pricing. And those are the revenue streams that go back to Uber, but they also go to the drivers themselves. Um, Let's maybe look at some of these sections here, key, act key partners and key activities. So how do they make this work? Um, you have payment processors, you have uh, companies already that are handling online payments. You've got Visa cards, you've got, you know, all, all the, the ways that payments are handled online. Uh, you have companies that are really doing that. Not only that, Uber needed a lot of investors. Uh, their model, they had a huge rapid growth model, and um, that required uh, being sort of first mover in as many new uh, areas as possible. And so they actually had huge numbers of investors, a huge amount of investment. Um, and, uh, and then map tech companies, that's quite interesting too. So, you know, to get for, for the drivers to find your house, right, they needed to have uh, ways of, uh, of getting the drivers there, right? And so that technology was sort of a precursor to Uber actually having a, a being an opportunity um, to, to have mapping. And some of the activities that they're doing, these key activities, again, they're, they're developing their platform. Um, they're marketing themselves to get people on the platform. They have to hire drivers and then they have to manage operations. Some of the key resources that um, that they're uh, dependent upon or need is the tech platform, the driver network, talented employees, and brand reputation. Okay, good so far. And then their cost structure, of course, they pay their own internal employees, they pay the drivers, um, they have a lot of legal fees because it's a very uh, legal, I would say, and uh, um, uh, like insurance fees, uh, marketing ads, and then managing their tech platform. So a bit more of a complicated pro uh, company, but not too bad. Quite, quite simply explained in this one diagram. Okay. Um, so that's the last example that I have, and I do think um, it would be good if uh, someone would be willing to share theirs. So now I'm gonna start to call on people. Okay, anyone want to share their, um, their business candidates? A couple possibilities are Ghost Gear, and um, Deborah, yeah, I I think Yago and I should share it since we're going to be talking about it in the uh, financial. That, that would be really good, I think. Yeah. I'm going to, see, um, I'm going to stop my screen it's share. A bit rough still. It's okay. <laughs> so, well, let's see. Yago, do you have it open? And it looks like we did lose Deborah, unfortunately. Um, I think I have it here. You have it at me? Yeah. I don't okay. know if this is the final one. Tell me if I'm, if I'm not. Let's see. Okay. There you go. Do you see it? Mm -hmm. Okay, That's so great. now that I see the examples that you gave us, maybe we have it too detailed and we need to simplify it. 
Uh, but basically, our value proposition would be um, helping other, or let's see, I'm going to read it, but let's help me simplify it. Um, so our social enterprise will help businesses to create products that are sustainable. Uh, I would say plastic products that are sustainable, traceable, and contribute to a circular economy uh, while directly contributing to the uh, prevention and prevention of the negative impacts that humankind has in the environment. So basically, we would be helping companies that make plastic products to have a sustainable and traceable product. I, I think that would be the way, best way to summarize it. Mm -hmm. um, and so and from, from, from what we saw of the way they sort of outlined the value proposition there, would does, do you think, does this capture what you need or would you rewrite it some way or? We're definitely gonna rewrite it. <laughs> yeah, sorry, actually we, and this is the last version, but I think we rewrite it at some point because, and I don't know where it is, <laughs> to be honest, because everyone we got feedback from David uh, already and we ex specifically mentioned that we were making high quality plastic pellets that are traceable and that are sustainable and that contribute to a circular economy, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So we very, we, I think in the new value proposition, we were very specific on mentioning that we were providing uh, plastic granulates, like high quality plastic granulates from recycled fishing nets. Uh, which I think it would right. be important to specify here. Um, um, yes. So yeah, we <laughs> def will definitely re have to rewrite right, it right. because it seems very vague in general. Um, and if you don't have a background, it's not understandable, I guess. That's the main problem, no? But, no, I think it's it's understandable, but it's too general. To mm -hmm. it doesn't capture the um, the the main core of, of what you're what you're doing the, the, the business let me I'm just going to try to uh, um, like some some of the ones like for the LinkedIn version um, it was very simple sort of manage professional identity and build professional network or identify for the for the recruiters it was identify and reach the right talent so if, it, if you're looking for something very simple like that, is there a way to just say simply that, uh, you know, um, you know, yeah. co collect and convert uh, uh, waste These... fishing material to high quality plastic? Yeah, then, something yeah. like tr transforming uh, ghost gear into high quality traceable plastic or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and sorry, I just want to give a little background for the other people, which I'm, I mean, it, this is all very clear for us because we are the ones doing it, but maybe people don't know exactly what Good we're idea, trying yeah, to do. Um, so what we're trying to do is we are want to collect and retrieve ghost fishing gear, which ghost fishing gear is fishing gear that has been discarded at sea by for X amount of reasons, but it's basically drifting in the ocean and it's capturing, you know, animals and it's still killing. And it's actually one of the, uh, it makes up 10% of the entire plastic pollution in the ocean, which is a lot. And actually just in the great Pacific, or I, I always never get it right, but the Pacific garbage patch, it makes up of 50%. Um, so it is a huge problem. So we're trying to tackle this problem by monetizing it and giving value to these raw to, to these nets that have been discarded. Or we also or we also want to tackle the prevention and we want to collect these nets before they reach the ocean by an incentive program and paying fishermen uh, just uh, let's say a dollar per kilo of their end of life fishing net. So when their net is old or, and they don't want to use it anymore, instead of them throwing it uh, into the landfill or back in the ocean, they give it to us because you pay, we're paying them. And then we want to, through our social enterprise, we want to transform these nets 
uh, that are waste basically into uh, high quality pellets and then sell these pellets to companies that use this pellet as a raw material to build their products, um, whatever products they, they have. So this is more or less um, the concept of what we want to do. That's it, Emilia, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Great, perfect. perfect. Thanks, Yago. Um, David, I have a question, because I don't know if Please. the business model should uh, tell somebody that knows nothing about the, the company, what is it about? Yeah, you should, right, that's right. Theoretically, you should be able to very quickly describe the company, the main points of the company to people that don't have any idea what you're doing. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that, that's great. Perfect. Um, so next would be customer segments. Yeah? Sure. And, well, basically, companies that we will be selling these pellets to companies who want to add value to their plastic products. So they could take advantage of the story they, the pellets have behind. Uh, we're cleaning the ocean by making these chairs or something like that. Um, what else? So how would we be, how would we be doing this? Well, through our customer relationship would be uh, basically personal communication with, uh, with the companies that make the, the plastic products. We would be selling emails and, and keeping them informed of what we're doing, where we're cleaning, how many animals they save by doing this, and collaboration and agreement. Yeah, so Emilia, you, you guys have, um, you've had a few calls with, with potential customers. Yeah. Um, from those calls, uh, what do you think matters to them in terms of a relationship with you? Why would they want to um, work with you? Um, I think because they are already, uh, they are already trying to tackle the problem. They are already trying to, they know they use plastic, but they want to use plastic from the ocean to help the environment. And I think one of the most important things that they would like is that it is traceable, 100% traceable. That would be one of the big added values for them. Right. So, some, so that, I think, is a really important um, element of, of the relationship, that you're able to, to maintain that, that you know, traceability. And that's okay. because that's like a key. Why, that's why they would want to work with you and maybe not other people. Uh-huh. Right, and the, I love the communication and everything. Yeah, too. yeah. We we sort of wanted to give them like you buy this pellet, or what we wanted to say in in this customer relationship was when you buy the pellet, you have a uh, this package of information of where it comes from. Maybe having like a QR uh, scan code or something that takes them back to the story of what where this plastic comes from. Something nice, like that. Nice. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have to work on the wording with that. Yeah. Um, and we would be selling it through, I don't know, websites. No, wait, channels is how we would be selling it, right? Um, selling and distributing. I mean, also mm -hmm. like selling and getting it to them, right? So how do you, you okay, ship okay. it and, and all that? Yeah. How do you get it? So we have it right here, the Expos. Yeah, I mean, the, the only other thing you might want to add there is, um, so those are sort of your communication and marketing channels, uh -huh. but you may want to add um, your, your transportation channels. Like, for example, you know, one of the options is sending nets to uh, Scandinavia from Mexico, and that has, that has high costs, yeah. right? And so, um, you know, uh, that's why we're looking at maybe build, getting a, a facility built locally um, to decrease those costs. So, th so that's that's also part of channels. Okay. Is yeah, is you know, sending material all over the world, or how you're selling it. Um, great. Yeah. 
Okay, so next would be key partners. I will go. So here, here is one of the, I think it's one of the parts that we've been struggling most going back and forth on who would be our partners and what would be our activities, what would we be doing. So we've been back and forth with this, but um, we would need partners that help us collect the raw material because we, we want to do it also, but it's not going to be enough to meet the demand. So we need key partners like NGOs or maybe the government or the fishery industries to help us retrieve or get to the raw material. Um, technology suppliers and a technology expert, that would be a great key partner. And um, somebody to help us distribute and like the company to send, ship it to whatever the company we're selling to is manufacturing. So like, those would be our partners. Right. And what, oh, yeah, any comments on this? Uh, no, no, go ahead. But I just, I want to also make sure just opening up the, co the conversation. So it's not just me and you, but if anyone else has thoughts yeah. or ideas here, questions specifically, that would be really great. I, I have a question of our own um, <laughs> business model. So on the key partners section, we included at the very bottom to say to sell pellets, like consumer good companies but they are our customers, but we also see them as key partners because we want to establish a partnership with them, uh, with our customers. So is it, is, it, is it all right to include key partners as also our customers or, or, or not? Or it's, uh, it's just another, just. It would um, keep it more, it would be more simple to, to, to not uh, include them because I mean, you want to have good relations with, with customers you want to form partners, long-term relations with with your customers as well as your suppliers. So mm -hmm. here, I would I would do more with answering the question. Of, so who who could you you know who can do things that you don't have to do? Right. Like what what um, this is really more on the on the input side. Um, yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I got it. So yes, yes. I think in, in both key, like now that you, when you explain what, you know, key partners and key activities and key resources and, and it's, you know, what strategic activities, what strategic yes. resources and partners that we need that in order for us to focus on what we want to do and let other people do, you know, things that maybe we don't have to do. I think we should like simplify this um, a little bit more. Yes. yes, yes, probably can. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, can I just make one comment here? Yes, please. please. Hi, sorry. Um, I do agree with what you said earlier. You really do need to focus this value proposition, be clear about the product. Uh, because you have that will then bring in other revenue streams as well as I think partners by being clear about your value proposition is to collect waste fishing nets, to collect old nets before they become waste fishing nets and then transform them into high quality traceable pellets. Because you're missing, I think in your partners, for example, your net sellers. I think the net, net people, the people who are selling them, uh, there's an interest now to show they're sustainable if they only sell nets when the people bring them back that's a great revenue. That's a great partnership for you. So all new nets are, are automatically collecting old nets that then they've collected for you. So become your distributors and your revenue streams are also then uh, will be bolstered by things like NGOs and programs that are already doing uh, gear replacement projects or uh, who are interested in reducing marine, pol marine pollution and are willing to provide funding for it. So focusing on that value proposition also I think opens up more, more partnerships and more revenue streams. Yes, yeah, for sure. You. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, 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 that, for sure. Yeah, yeah, um, we need to rework the value proposition. Absolutely, yeah, thank you so much. 
yeah, and the net sellers, it's a great idea. We, we sort of thought about it, but never in, I don't know why it's not there. <laughs> but yeah, it's a, that's a great, great, uh, thank you. Um, do, does, does anyone else want to share? I just want to make sure we, we give other people a chance to share their, um, uh, um, yeah, I'm trying to think of who, who else is on here. Um, we, we lost Deborah, but, um, Alois and Lynette, do you guys want to share your, uh, model? Hi, David. It's, it's Lynette here. Uh, and yeah, it was hi. interesting to see Amelia's and um, Iago's um, business canvas model. And I think it goes to show that um, just framing the business concept would take quite a while. It's a back and forth process. So we are still in the same body as you guys, but you, um, you, you already have uh, populated it. Unfortunately, I do not have um, the presentation that we last updated with me. I'm not so sure if my colleague Alois um, has the last updated one. I uh, will be happy to talk you guys through, but it's not significantly different from um, um, the scope that um, Emilia has shared. And we are also refining our um, value proposition, which I think once we crack, um, should help us to shape the other pieces much more clearer. Um, so, so hopefully, or well, Alice is, is looking at it. So while he's doing that, I can take advantage and just give my sentiments to how I had Amelia's presentation. So, so I guess, again, the reason why we couldn't just quickly jump on it to give much valuable input at this stage it's because it goes back to the point David made earlier on. If the value proposition is not crystal clear, it makes it very difficult to engage with the other pieces. So I know the work WWF does um, with regards to the blockchain, looking at the fish itself. And it sounds more or less like the similar system that you guys want to do, but um, looking at the waste management aspect of it. So I could sort of relate but disconnect because I wasn't so sure to the extent in which you guys want to do this traceability. So it sort of just leaves hanging it um, midway uh, because you, you, you can trace where you're getting the nets and up to the consumers, it seems they can do and discard it whichever way. It, it's not yet clear how that value proposition of traceability is embraced in your business concept at the moment. But I like the beginning of it and I like the broader vision. It's solid and like I said, I'm, I'm privy to what WWF is doing on the blockchain. It's a fantastic concept if you guys keep working on the uh, value proposition and make it very clear what is it that you're selling. So I hope Alice has managed to bring ours on board um, so that we can also just share that you guys are as amazing as we are. <laughs> we are in the same board. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for your feedback. Thank you. You're welcome. So, so I think I'll hand over to David. Um, um, and hopefully, if Alois brings it back, we'll also be happy to talk through and share with you where we are. Great. Thank you, Lynette. Really appreciate that. And um, I'm not sure. Um, I think we're running out of time here, so uh, unfortunately, we probably won't have time uh, in this session to uh, to go over that. But so let me just open it up for for any any questions at this stage and thoughts that anyone wants to share. I have a question. When we are at Greenstein, we haven't started working on this. Um, when we have started working on a business plan, but not this fabulous one pager. And I'm curious. As we're developing this, do you think it's wise to think about it as if it's a, a, a piece of material you can use when explaining your business model and show it to other people? Or is it really just, should we think of it as an internal document? Um, I think of it as an internal document. I, I, I um, you know, they did, they did say something about you can use it to, you know, talk to investors and talk to other people. 
but I tend to um, consider it something that that's most mostly useful for internal strategizing and making sure you have a clear vision and understanding of what your business, what's driving your business and what, what the value is and who your customers are. I mean, all that stuff ultimately gets written out into an investor presentation. Um, but, but, you know, I, I would, I would not include the, the business model canvas in an investor presentation, for example, it's just too much information in, in a, a compact place, but for, for internally, uh, now anal internal analysis and, um, yeah, but I'd love to get Ben um, Guillon's thoughts on that, um, if, if they're any different than mine. Ben, I'm not sure um, how you would respond to that. From an investor's point of view, is, it, is a, a business model canvas useful? Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I will not, I will not incorporate that into the... Uh... Um, into the, uh, the, the the slides because usually the slides are um, you know forwarded around and you're not you're not in the room now you can use that when you're with the investors to put it on the on the screen as a way to uh, to talk through things um, you know that's one of the tools you you may want to use since you're in the impact space you know sometimes it's the visual may be better if you have a, a theory of change and, and you will convey the same type of information um, from your business canvas um, through the, with the theory of change on the, on the screen. So it's, it's, it's your choice, but yes, it's not um, for, for investors that are not necessarily used to um, looking at the business canvas. It may, it may feel a little messy you just you know you just don't know where where to look so you can use it but just just be strategic that would be my uh my advice thank you guys yeah but it's de definitely um it's definitely worth um doing you know especially you know for you guys i think um it would be a perfect way to kind of focus in on on what the uh what the primary uh, model is, yeah. So good. Well, I well, think yeah, we're, we're that's. I think that's very important. Is like uh, investors have moved away something that investors don't want to see anymore. That was like 20 years ago, where you would show up with a 50-page business plan and you'd expect the your your uh, investors to read that. I mean, you're wasting. If if it's useful for you to write 50 pages, do it. But don't think that it will be useful for anybody else. That's why the uh, that one pager, because it is so like easy to update and all that, is is a fantastic tool. So don't don't ever write, you know, the traditional business plan for an investor. That's that's totally out of date. That that's very, uh, you know, nineteen nineties. I don't know how many business plans I've written, but you're making me feel old, Ben. <laughs> Sorry, David. <laughs> it's okay. Um, but anyway, um, so I think we were out of time, but um, I thought that was a, hopefully it was a good uh, presentation. I thought it was a very good discussion. And um, uh, thank you um, to Amelia and Yago for uh, presenting. I think it was really great to have a, a real live, um, project to, to look at this on and um uh yeah so I, we'll, we'll I'll, I'll make sure we can send around this powerpoint make sure everyone has it um, everyone has access to to these blank um versions of this online and um uh the next session will be next week kumar you tell remind us when that is no if you're if you're able to yeah, let me, um, <clears throat> right, so it's Monday um, the 20th at uh, 11 a.m. Eastern. Okay, great, and, and that'll be, um, you know, financial statements and, and starting to build uh, financial models. That's two, it's a two session uh, sort of, uh, two, two call session basically. So we'll have one on Monday and one on I think Thursday. Great. All right. Well, thanks everyone. And, um,
we will uh, we'll talk to you all uh, soon at the latest next Monday. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Ah, so cute. <laughs>